Hello. Hello. Here we are here. It is Sunday. It is the gathering room. You know what's fun is to, you know, when you hold a dog over water, they start to swim in the air. And that's that's kind that's of fun. the gesture. Hi. Hi. And they, you can, you just hold them over the water and they swim. So that's what you've been doing down at the river with our dogs. <laughs> and any doing. other animal I can trap. <laughs> We saw two Pam. beavers once. Hi, Hi Pam. Mary. Hi, Shannon. Shannon and Melanie. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Yay, Kathy is here. And Karen. And our Amanda. I and Karen, guys. again, but a different spelling. And Robin. And everybody is here. All the people is here. It's so nice. It's I will so swim like a dog in the air. They do this kind of choppy motion. <laughs> This week on The Gathering Room, swimming like a dog in the air. <laughs> swimming like head. a dog in the air, yes. In the air. It's in very important. Yeah. <laughs> air swimming. It's fun. <laughs> Try it's it. the latest craze. Swimming Ooh, this is different. Oh, that's This like, is more like squirrels. Yes, it's air galloping. <laughs> this is wild, you guys. Lucky you didn't miss out on this. All new exercise craze. Um, I'm going to get out of the way. How many peoples are here? We have that many people. Oh my gosh, let's keep going. <laughs> all right, so of course today you know what we're talking about. What we're always talking about, Dante's Divine Comedy, because that's what I happen to be writing about at this point in my life. And Dante is amazing, but confusing. And all kinds of very confusing things do happen. And today I was writing about um, a point in the spiritual journey, psychological spiritual journey, where Dante is ready to come into complete awakening, okay? So let me set it up for you. <clears throat> for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he wakes up at the, at the beginning of the poem, and he's just, like, lost. He's, like, middle-aged and, and middle-income and middle-everything, uh, but he's kind of lost in the dark woods. Ah! And then he, this poet named Virgil, who is dead, shows up and says, don't worry, I will take you out of this terrible place. And he takes him to a gate that says, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. So, of course, they go in, they abandon all hope. They go down through hell. And Dante sees all the horrible things that happen to you if you are bad. Interestingly, by my reading, nobody in hell needs to be there. They would get out. He can go through. Dante can go through. Why? Because he doesn't have to believe what these people in hell believe. They're actually stuck in hell by their beliefs. So, for example, if they're enraged, they spend their eternity being enraged. They're trapped by their rage. If they let go of the beliefs that caused the rage, they could leave. But they don't. That's what hell is about. So then... Dante keeps going all the way through the center of hell, and because he reaches the center of the earth, when he keeps going the same direction, he's now suddenly headed up toward the stars, and he comes out, and he comes to the foot of purgatory. We've talked about this. It's a mountain. He climbs up it, and then he gets to the top. Now, climbing purgatory in his reading is it's the effort by which you shift all your negative patterns until you're living a life that allows you to be to enter paradise, okay? So I got to the part where he's right at the top, and at the top, he finds the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, he meets a woman named Beatrice, who in real life was Dante's beloved. And he fell in love with her when she was eight. I thought, when I first heard that, I thought, oh my God, he was a pedophile. No, Dante was nine at the time, so it was appropriate, age appropriate. So he fell deeply, madly in love with this beautiful girl. And she died when she was 24. And he never got over it. Like, he, he just kept loving her for the rest of his life. So when he writes his epic poem and he gets to the very top of purgatory where all his sins are corrected, who should he run into but Beatrice? But the weird thing is, she just doesn't act like a leading lady in a Western epic story. Like, she's kind of itchy bay if you know what I mean. She's very firm. She, she doesn't come and say, oh, I love you so much. She says, hey, hey, look over here. Eyes on me, eyes on me. He actually describes her as being like the admiral of his ship. Like she, she bosses him around. She's like, look at me. And he can barely look at her because she's so bright that he says it's as if a bolt of lightning struck but then just stayed. 
So lightning flashes and you're blinded. Well, she is that bright all the time. And she's saying, look at me, look at me. And when he does look at her, he knows that she sees right through him. And she actually tells him, I've been trying to get through to you ever since I died. I've been showing up in dreams. I've been showing up in inspiration. I've been trying to get through to you in every way I could. I could you weren't listening to me. You went off to do things that could never make you happy. You thought they would make you happy, but they never could. And you went so far into unhappiness that I was like out of my mind, wanting to know how I could get you back. So what I did, she says, I knew you had to go in to see the lost people in hell. I knew this, you had to go on this journey. You had to go deep, deep, deep into your own hell and then come up through your own purgatory before you could get back to a place where you can be happy. And oh, that's the very first thing she says to him. She says, look at me, don't you understand that you're supposed to be happy? Be happy, you're supposed to be happy, never forget it. And she says, so you've come all this way. Oh, by the way, the only reason Virgil was ever involved is that Beatrice is so angelic, she can't go to hell. So she had to get Virgil, because he was eh, a little nastier, actually because he lived before Christianity, so of course he couldn't get into heaven as quickly. Anyway, so he went down to hell and brought Dante through. And then as soon as Dante is ready to be with Beatrice, Dante, Virgil goes away. <gasps> Dante's horrified, by the way, because Dante's all nice and soothing, but Beatrice is not. She's kind of itchy, babe. Except she's not. What she is, I believe, is a representation of Dante's soul. And I base this on an experience I had, I probably told you about this too. When I was 29, I was having a really rough time in my life, like really seriously rough. And I ended up in surgery. And during the surgery, I became conscious and was looking around the room and then thinking, well, this is odd because I'm like flat on a slab with my eyes shut. Why am I sitting up looking around the room? And it was kind of disorienting and then I laid back and a light appeared above me and it was exactly the closest you could come to describing its brightness is exactly what Dante says when he describes Beatrice. It's like, it was like the only thing I've ever seen that's as bright as that is lightning, but it's sustained. Happily, since I wasn't like conscious, <laughs> well, I wasn't physically, I wasn't looking at it with my physical eyes, my eyes were closed, but I could see it. And I could look at it without my eyes hurting. Um, and it, it grew and then it touched me and then it filled me with this inexpressible comfort and love and sweetness. And what it said was exactly what Beatrice says to Dante in the Divine Comedy. It says, hey, you forgot I was here. Do you remember you're supposed to be happy? You were meant to be happy. You've been waiting to get through life until you can be happy again, but you're supposed to never forget again that you're supposed to be happy. So sorry you had to go through hell. So sorry you've had to fight so hard, but now we're back together. Never, ever, ever lose me again. Never look away from me again. And I woke up just sobbing hysterically from joy and from relief that this was reality. And I didn't have to be, um, I didn't have to believe in a world where just life is so hard and then you die and there's nothing else. This light felt so much more real than anything I'd ever felt that it was just, it was just clear to me that I was never going to look away. And I kind of haven't, like I think about it every single hour of every day. I'm pretty sure that every hour that I'm not asleep, I, I actively think about that light often. <clears throat> it was that kind of experience. So Here's the thing that Beatrice does before she can take Dante on to paradise. She makes him bathe in two sides of a river. And the first one is called the lethe, which means oblivion in Greek. And it causes him to forget anything he's ever done that was bad. Oh, first I should tell you, with Beatrice shining on him and telling him she's been watching absolutely everything he's, he's ever done, including the embarrassing things and the not so great things, He's so embarrassed, he passes out. Like he's so full of shame and self-loathing that he can't tolerate being seen so completely. And he faints. And when he wakes up, he's in this river and somebody's dunking him in the, in the first side, which causes him to forget everything he's ever done wrong. And then Beatrice says, 
I need you to disentangle yourself from fear and shame so that you no longer speak as one who dreams. So she's telling him, you're still in the mindset of humans where you think that you're bad because you've made mistakes. So now you're gonna, you've forgotten all your mistakes. Now she takes him to the other side of the river, which is called the you know. And eunoia in Greek means beautiful thinking or true thinking. And he gets dunked in that side of the river and it makes him remember all of his life, except none of the, none of the bad parts, everything he's ever done right comes back to him. It kind of reminded me, if you've seen uh, the TED Talk by Jill Bolte-Taylor or read her amazing book, My Stroke of Insight, she was a woman who lost the whole left hemisphere of her brain function to a massive stroke when she was 37. And then over many years, like eight years of work, she built back her brain. She re when she was first out of the stroke, she didn't remember her mother's name. She didn't remember anything. She didn't remember language. It all came back very gradually and with a lot of work. But she deliberately decided that she was not going to build back any of the bad parts. So when she was coming out of the stroke initially, she didn't know the word mother and she didn't remember who her mother was, but she knew energy. She could sense a loving energy or an energy that was distracted or pushy or she was acutely aware of energy. And she says in her book, look, if you're going to visit a patient in the hospital who, who appears to have little cognitive function, be careful of your energy. Come in there with a loving, gentle energy because they are picking up energetic signals. Um, and it's not mystery and it's not magic. It's just that we sense people's energy. So she built back the memory of her mother, but she didn't bring any of the baggage. Like it was like a perfect course of therapy where she could little, literally just excise memories of strife and difficulty in their relationship. She just built back on the foundation of the love. So this is kind of what happens to Dante in the Divine Comedy. And it really got me thinking today, what's the equivalent for us like I know the equivalent for going through hell. You look at the places where you're making mistakes and you see where you've made errors that are making you miserable. Like thinking, oh, um, you know, whatever, I'm not good enough. That's a very common errant thought. Like I was just born not good enough. Almost everyone have, has that, it's, it's primordial shame. It's because every single one of us, when we were babies at some point realized, oh, the way I'm actually like normally behaving, like taking off my clothes and running around the house naked, that's not okay. It's not okay to be myself bare naked. And it's kind of like in the Garden of Eden in the biblical story, Adam and Eve aren't ashamed until they eat the fruit of the tree. And then it's like, oh, we don't, now I'm not, I, it's not okay to be me. I'm, before that they are naked and unashamed, then they get shame. So that happens to all of us as infants when we're growing into older children, we learn to modify our behavior. And then we internalize this primordial shame that says I'm not good enough. So that will keep you in hell very effectively if you don't question it. You will go through your life doing all kinds of dysfunctional things if you continue to believe I'm not good enough, just the way I am, the way nature and God made me. If you question that belief and free yourself from it, sometimes you can get periods where you don't believe it and you find yourself almost rising like a bubble. And that's kind of going up out of hell, you get clear of hell, but in order to make it stick, you have to do the work. Like you may go to therapy or a coach and they can help you question the thought, I'm not good enough, and you can start to become free of that. And that's, it's, it's a change in your basic neurology, your brain wiring that you get at, with repetition as you go up. So what though, what is it that makes you literally able to forget everything you've done wrong and remember everything you've done right. And by the way, this also, you find it in near-death experience accounts sometimes that people, they see a light, they go through a tunnel, there are various different things that happen. But, and by the way, they can see what's happening in the room around them, even if they were unconscious or blind. So I tend to believe them, um, most of them. But they get to a place where some people see their whole lives and they have a very different understanding of them. And many of them are with a, a beloved figure or a being of light and the, the figure of light like Beatrice in the Garden of Eden ha has you watch your whole life the whole thing 
And a lot of people say, I was really embarrassed. I wasn't perfect. I did bad things. But the light never judged me. The only person judging me was me. And so th there is, I actually think Dante had some kind of experience like this. And so what do you get from that moment when you're with a being of complete and total forgiveness? How do you enter that state without having to go through a near-death experience or, you know, once in a lifetime white light surgery or whatever? So Ro and I were talking about it all day today. And we decided that there are some steps. Yes, just ordinary steps you can take. The first thing is that as you look at any, so think of something that causes you some level of shame and you, you haven't forgiven yourself. You're embarrassed about yourself still in this way. You're afraid, like if you were to put it up online and everyone knew it, you'd be embarrassed. It's that simple. So think of something like that. And now think, why did you do it? And what you want to examine is not what you know now, but what you knew at the time you did this. So we were talking about the example of a woman who went to a baby shower. It was a surprise baby shower. And everybody like, surprise, surprise, the pregnant mother is there. Everybody's exchanging gifts. And suddenly this woman gets up, knocks over some packages, runs for the room, doesn't come back. Rude, right? Except then, the other women eventually found out that this woman had had eight miscarriages and no baby. Can you feel how immediately, the moment you understand where she's coming from, the rude judgment just goes, oh my God, you poor thing. <laughs> like, you go into a deep empathic understanding. When I was trained in sociology, they call this, um, by the German word for understanding, Verstehen. And because sociology was originally created by Germans, the word Verstehen, which is German, entered English sociology as empathic understanding of another person's viewpoint. The first step in forgiving yourself is to look at yourself, not the way you usually do, but as your soul does, as that bright white light does, the non-judgmental being inside you that sees everything truly. And you will be able to experience Verstehen for the person you were in that moment. And I believe that without exception, when you truly, deeply understand the motivation of the person who did that thing, your heart will release the judgment and you will go into compassion. But that's not the rest, that's not the whole trick because then you might engage in something that Buddhists call idiot compassion where you forgive things and then keep doing them over and over or you forgive someone who's been hurting people over and over and you don't do anything to stop them. So in order to get to the other side of the river, what you have to do is set a boundary a boundary that's very, very solid that says, okay, number one, I understand what made me do that rude thing. You know, or, you know, I was, my heart was hurting. It's understandable. Second thing, okay, being put, for example, for that woman with her trauma around pregnancy to put herself in a room full of women who were celebrating a birth was just too much to take. So the second part, of self-forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to allow that situation to arise anymore. So say I was, like I used to be a binge eater, okay? I was anorexic for a while, then I was a binge eater and I couldn't control myself. And then I realized that I was doing this because I had a lot of traumatic, um, traumatic experiences as a child, strange interpretations of the world based on my upbringing and that it was causing me to do things that literally made me sick. I've got nothing against eating, by the way. I, I hope I don't come across as that person, but I, I, it was the out of controlness of it and the fact that I was doing something that actually hurt my body, physically hurt, in order to drown my emotional trauma. The moment I, understand, I understood that, I realized that I needed to stay out of situations it's kind of like the 12 step thing where you, it's called halt. You don't go anywhere where you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, H-A-L-T. Like stay out of those situations. If you're an alcoholic and you're in those situations, you'll probably be weak enough to take a drink. If you're trying to sm stop smoking and you're in those situations, you'll wanna smoke. It's gonna be too hard. Like understand yourself deeply, then know the situation where things went wrong 
and make sure that doesn't happen again. So the same thing is true of forgiving another person. Say somebody's a serial killer. Forgive them. Go ahead and forgive them. But make sure they get prosecuted and sent to jail first so they don't keep murdering people. Then you can say, I'm going to open my heart completely and fully accept you. So it's <clears throat> you need to first go into deep understanding. Second, from that deep understanding, create a place of calm and peace where the error isn't likely to arise again. And then acknowledge that it probably will arise again, that you probably will do things you don't like doing over and over and over again, and be willing to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. One thing that I really feel in my heart of hearts is that no matter how many times we make mistakes, we are instantly forgiven by the love of the universe. And when we come into our own truth, we instantly know that it's okay. You are okay. You never needed to be ashamed and you never needed to hate yourself and you never needed to feel like you weren't good enough in any situation. In the worst thing you ever did, you were still absolutely 100% okay. So as Beatrice says, I want you to disentangle yourself from fear and guilt and shame that you no longer speak like one who dreams. So after you come out of the dream, and in Asia they'd say when you awaken, you realize that the whole idea of not forgiving yourself was just a nightmare, that nothing you've ever done was wrong enough not to be forgiven, and that who you essentially are was never touched by anything but goodness. So that is my thinking on self-forgiveness, and I hope you can think through whatever it was that you brought up as your example, and go into that deep understanding, and then create structures so that you don't end up being that in that much pain again. And if you do end up being in that much pain and bad things happen, forgive yourself as quickly as possible. Awaken from the dream of shame and fear. So I'm gonna invite the notorious badger back. Come in, notorious badger. No way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have some questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, Karen asks, why might you put yourself in a situation that's painful, especially when you know you might be triggered? Doesn't the need to forgive place additional burden on your heart? Mm. The need to forgive is not something that's an imperative, like it's a virtue you should do. It is, it is letting yourself off the hook. There's no... Um, there's no effort in it at all. I must forgive. That's actually part of judgment. This was a big aha we had today. We realized that there's a way of forgiving this, like be righteous, forgive those who are wrong. And that's just a part of a judgmental mindset. Real forgiveness is like, maybe you felt when I said that woman had eight miscarriages, you kind of go, oh, and like there's no effort at all. You have absolutely released all judgment. Um, so first of all, um, Self-forgiveness isn't a virtue you must practice. It's a freedom that you access. What was the original part of the question? <laughs> uh, sorry, I just went into something completely different. She asked about the burden of, of oh. forgiveness on your own heart. Uh, yeah, and you don't take it as... Um, sorry, there was a part before that that I don't remember. It and why, I was, why might you put yourself in a situation that's, that's painful, it. especially when you know you might be triggered? She means the act of... Oh, I see, because I thought it was a whole different thing, because actually we do put ourselves over and over in situations that are painful, and that actually leads us to behaviors that we then think we have to be forgiven for. good example is somebody who is abused by her parents growing up, or his parents, ends up partnering with someone who's very vindictive or even physically abusive, because that's the pattern of love that, that they've learned as a child. It's an error. It's an innocent error. But over and over, we put ourselves in situations that are hellish so that we can wake up to the reasons we're there and then change our behavior patterns. So this is why our souls send us into hell and, and into purgatory over and over. Like, okay, you need to get over it being abused by your parents. So your soul lets you go into a relationship that's abusive later in life so that you can open up and understand, oh, I get why I did that again. And at that point, you, you stop interacting with people who are abusive and you can sort of feel 
that energy coming and instead of going toward it, you learn to move away from it because you love yourself. And, and that's not a harm. It's, it's self-compassion, self-understanding, and then self-liberation. Thanks. Sorry about that, going back and forth. No problem. So Cynthia was a bit confused about the way that Beatrice shows up mm. in the Itchy Bay way. Um, she said the light energy you described on the operating table seemed more loving and was equated with a similar soul experience. Can this energy come up like Beatrice was manifested, like an angry Old Testament god? Well, here's the interesting thing. The reading that I got that said that she was witchy is not from Dante himself. It's from commentators on Dante. In Dante's mind, she was being absolutely loving. She's completely, um, I mean, she is the epitome of all good things. And he says, I felt the, what does he say? The, the burning of old love. And it shakes him so hard. He says, there's not a drop of my blood that's not trembling right now. But none of that is coming from Beatrice. It's all coming from his own guilt. So as soon as he gets over his own self-blame, her presence is completely benevolent. And it is the whole time anyway. The only thing that's, that's bumping up against it is his own shame and guilt. So it's like copper wire that has impurities in it. And she's like an electricity that flows through the wire. And wherever it hits an impurity, it, it creates a spark. It's not because the electricity is harmful. It's because there's something in the copper that doesn't conduct it very well. So she is pure, pure, pure love. The most love he's found yet. But because he still blames himself for things, he feels shame in the presence of being absolutely seen. So I know sometimes when people come in for coaching or when I went to therapy the first time, you know, I sat there and as soon as somebody said, here's my perception of you, I think you're deeply depressed and anxious, I wanted badly to be seen. But my first reaction to being seen was shame. And that's really typical of most of us, that when pure love walks into the room, it doesn't play our games. It says, I see you. And she, what she says is, I want you to be happy. But he experiences it as I'm not good enough. And it becomes very, very clear. He spells out how that's not her. It's not coming from her. It's coming from him. So I don't think the, there are angry gods anywhere. I just don't. Anne-Marie says, what if you feel like you owe someone an apology, but you have no way of contacting them? It works really well to like write them a letter apologizing that you'll, ne you'll never send or um, apologize to them in spirit. Here's a weird thing that's happened to me more and more over the years. I will feel a connection with someone, someone I love, and then they'll call me on the phone or I'll realize that they were thinking of me and we get together later and oh, I realize, huh, that's true. And I've actually even, maybe this has happened to you, like you, you see an email, somebody sends you an email and you disagree with it and you energetically get a little fussy with them and then you feel the connection between your energy getting a little fractious and then you feel like an argument in space. <laughs> and then you reconcile it in your own heart and you can feel the energy coming down and then you email back. And I used to think that those were in my imagination, but I'm old enough now and I've checked it out with enough people that it, I, I actually believe now that our energies are interacting even when we're across the planet from each other. And I've had really good validation of that. Like people saying, yep, that's exactly what was happening at that time. So. Finding self-forgiveness and letting ourselves off the hook means that we're free in our relationships with other people. And we start to release the shame of things we did wrong for those people. And by clearing that, we can be absolutely honest in our, our um, apology, in our hearts. And that's more powerful, I believe, than being angry in your heart, but going up to them and going, I totally forgive you and I'm sorry I did what I did. The real forgiveness of the heart moves the other person more than physical contact without honesty. I truly believe that. Yeah, I do too. Um, before we finish up, I thought I would just... No, I've absolutely lost it. Um, 
I'm sorry. This is our new system. Yeah, the new system is not fit for tricky. Your, as Adam would say, that's a tricky way. way. Sandy. Sandy asked, how can you connect with the light if you haven't had an experience like you had? Um, speaking of my son, Adam, I think I've told you guys several times about how he had an experience seeing this light in his room. He didn't tell me about it for years, for like four years. And when he did tell me that he'd been in his room feeling bad and this light appeared and it touched his heart and opened his heart. And it meant that he was never as sad ever again. And I told him about my experience and I said, you know, the light told me it's always with us, even if we can't see it. And he said, well, I can see it. And I said, you can like right now, like for a year after that experience, all I did was like sit around crying because I couldn't see it anymore. I knew it was there, but I wanted to be with it and see it. And I said, where is it for you? Where do you see it? Is it in your head? Is it in your heart? Is it in your the corner of the room? And he just shook his head and said, Mom, it's everywhere. And it is. It shines through everything. It is everything. It turns out that the deeper you go into it and the more, you know, I, that's why I ended up meditating for hours and hours and hours. I was, I was reaching for it. I was inviting it. I was trying to get rid of the partition between us. And what happens is you get deeper and deeper and that feeling and that almost the visual image of that light becomes so strong that compared to it, the physical world becomes obviously unreal. And you realize, oh, this really is a dream. And what's, what's not a dream, the awake consciousness is pure love, is pure light, it's pure creation. And everything it's doing is spinning out these stories in our lives and it never ever hates us or blames us or holds us in shame for anything it's all part of the light creating greater compassion greater delight greater joy and you are an absolutely essential component of the universe and its joy in being as Byron Katie says, if you knew how important you were, you would shatter into a billion pieces and just be light. And I believe that that is true. And self-forgiveness is how we get to it. Thank you. So I love you guys. Thanks for showing up for my weird little musings. And I hope to see you again next week, next week on The Gathering. Bye.